Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Bhutang tamang sankang namasami I was hoping to be able to wish Ajahn Amro happy birthday, most people have today. But, uh, he's had a surprisingly long and full day, so he was invited to take the evening to himself for his birthday as a birthday gift. And he accepted it without arguing. <laughs> I wanted to reflect a little bit this evening on the, what we call the four idipadas, the roads to power, the roads to success. It's kind of referred to with different translations in English. They're a very, very good tool to use and to reflect upon often in the course of our practice. So we all somehow end up here in the monastery. We all have our stories, our experiences, but somehow what we have in common that brings us here is experience of suffering and wanting to find a way to deal with that. And very often that's our initial aspiration. Find a way of dealing with suffering, find a way, finding some relief from suffering. So in these four idipadas, the first one is chanda, this is aspiration. And we all have an aspiration. We wouldn't be here otherwise. And then the second of these four dipadas is the factor of energy, effort, the energy and the efforts that we put forth to try to realize this aspiration. The third one is citta in Pali, is how one sets one's heart to realize that aspiration. And the fourth one is vimangsa, it's this ability to review, review the previous three. So this path of practice is a progressive path of cultivating mindfulness, cultivating understanding. When we start off, we have a certain understanding of what suffering is according to how we experience it. And we have an idea of what it is we're looking for in terms of relief of suffering. 
So that's a certain level of understanding. And then as we practice, as we listen to teachings, as we read Dhamma, we get the opportunity to talk Dhamma with Kalyanamitas, ask questions from teachers, and spend time with ourselves, with this experience, with what's happening, this body, this mind, this life that kind of happens to us in some way. And as we learn to look at that and start appreciating what we have in front of us, our understanding matures, changes, it evolves. How we look at things changes. What we pay attention to changes. So this path that we're on, this practice that we're cultivating and developing is the same as everything else in samsara. It's changing. So it's a very useful thing to do to regularly stop and take stock and look at where we're at. What is the overall aspiration that we have? In the ceremony of ordination, we have this phrase which says, we aspire to cross over the river of suffering, this mass of suffering, to attain liberation. So that's the overarching goal. But then on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes it's difficult to relate to that in terms of our daily lives, daily experiences, the duties we may have, the people we live with, the circumstances that arise, and we need to meet. Sometimes we wake up in the morning and find ourselves in a bit of a mood. As soon as you wake up, you realize there's a mood there. And we don't always like that mood. It might be a happy mood come flying out of bed to greet a new day. But there are all kinds of moods, and sometimes those moods are the first thing that greets us when we wake up, and we don't like it. And then desire, tanha, and aspiration, chanda, can sometimes seem to get blurred. I aspire to be free of this mood, but I really want to get rid of it. And the difference between desire and the aspiration is that desire is guided by ignorance, whereas an aspiration is informed by wisdom. Desire leads to further suffering, Chanda, in this context of practice, leads to a lessening of suffering, to the end of suffering. And so we need to learn how to watch what's happening, look at what is in front of us, in terms of our experience, in our hearts, in our bodies, in our minds, at any given point in time. Because that's all we have. We walk around in these bodies, we walk around with these minds. Wherever we go, we take our moods with us. We don't leave them behind. We take our reactivity with us. We take our prejudices, our memories, our hopes, our views, our attachments, our likes and dislikes. We take that with us wherever we go.
So in this aspect of chanda, the aspiration, noticing what our aspiration is and noticing how we can refine this aspiration. What is it at this point in time? There's this classic scenario that unfolds for us, and I think it unfolds for us whatever our spiritual inclinations may be, our religious identification, even atheists somehow kind of experience this. As when we're suffering, we feel very committed to find an exit, a freedom from suffering. People tend to go and light a candle in church and pray to God to help with something when they're suffering. And then when the suffering ceases, they forget about church, they forget about God and go and party, have a good time. When Ajahn Chah was flying over from Thailand the first time to come to England, there was a leg of the flight if I remember accurately, is the flight from Kabul in Afghanistan. Back then, airplanes couldn't fly the distances they can today. So there's a flight from Kabul to Rome. And on leaving Kabul, the, something happened to one of the landing gears. And they weren't sure if the landing gear was in good shape so they could land safely in Rome. So in Rome, the plane had to do an approach and let the people on the ground examine the landing gear on a first round, and then they got the clear and they could land because they realized it was okay. But as the pilot and the airline staff on board were informing the passengers to buckle up and be safe, Ajahn Chah had to take out his dentures if something happened so you wouldn't choke on them or something. And a lot of people were panicking, being experiencing a lot of fear on the airplane, and everybody was turning to Ajahn Shah and asking him for help. And the plane lands safely. They come to a stop and everybody's cheering and clapping and goes and says thank you and kisses the pretty air hostesses. And nobody comes to say thank you to Lumpur Shah. <laughs> That's how the mind works. So noticing this aspiration, this chanda, where are we at? It's really useful to ask ourselves that question often. Sometimes we feel inspired to practice, sometimes we don't. We feel uninspired. Sometimes we experience very clear suffering. Sometimes we have the feeling that Actually, everything's pretty okay right now. And then what happens to this aspiration? What happens to the efforts that we're putting forth to realize that aspiration? What happens to the determination when we had, how set is our heart on pursuing this path? on walking this path, on developing the factors, the Eightfold Path. And to learn to have this ability to review where we're at, what are the efforts that we're putting forth, how determined are we, how committed are we to the practice. And it doesn't mean the harder you try and the more determined and stubborn you are, that the better it is. That's not necessarily the case. When we look at our aspiration, we may sometimes realize that we have this long-term goal of reaching the complete sea of freedom from suffering. But right now, here today, 
something else has arisen in our experience. There's a different challenge today. That's causing us suffering, that is making us feel stuck, that we're trying to get beyond. What is it and how do I adapt the efforts that are making? How do I set my heart skillfully on trying to understand this? Is more effort required or may, is less effort required? I'm trying too hard. Are the efforts well guided, well informed? Looking at the eight factors of the path, realize this first factor of right view is absolutely paramount. It's the first factor of the path for a reason. Because if we don't manage to see things clearly, according to their things according to their nature, seeing things for what they are, then when we put forth effort, it will be well guided according to right view or misguided if we're not seeing clearly. And we can put forth a lot of energy, a lot of effort into practice coming from a place that's not clearly understanding. And then we feel frustrated, we feel upset, we feel dejected, discouraged, disappointed. So in learning to appreciate the aspiration and what it is, it's important to understand right view. To understand what the Buddha describes as being right view. And the most basic definition of right view is understanding of the Four Noble Truths actually understanding what suffering is. What the causes of suffering is, are the three forms of desire, or as Lumpo puts it, ignorant attachment to desire. To really look at that and want to understand it. And as we do, little by little, as the nature of desire starts becoming clear to us, as the nature of suffering starts becoming clearer, the nature of cessation starts revealing itself as well. As right understanding is refined and developed, the other seven factors of the path fall into place by themselves because they're guided by right understanding. So some days we can be very motivated, very inspired, listening to some of these reflections that Lung Pao offers here in the temple, and then we go out and walk in the field, sit in our rooms, and we're all jazzed up with good energies, inspired. And then other times we can just be sitting in our room, sitting outside on a bench in the field, in the cloister, here in the temple. We're not particularly inspired, but we're also not suffering in any particular way. Physically, the body's okay. 
mentally, we can even ask ourselves, am I unhappy? It's like, no, I'm okay. Temperature is pleasant. It's silent. I'm well fed. I drank enough. I'm not neither thirsty nor hungry. I don't feel sore anywhere. Everything's just fine. And yet there's no motivation to practice. And so when we arrive at areas, at moments like this, when the circumstances that present themselves are of this nature, to come back to this factor of investigation, of reviewing, what is the aspiration? What was the reason we came here in the first place? Remembering that. And then being willing to examine what suffering actually is. We may not be experiencing any clear form of suffering here and now, but then all we have to do is remember morning chanting. Birth is suffering. I don't remember my birth. Aging is suffering. Hey, I'm only 51. Sickness is suffering. It's okay, I'm fine now. Death is suffering. Well, I'm still alive. So on these four counts, no suffering yet. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. There's none of that quite present right now. Being associated with the disliked or being separated from the liked, not getting what one wishes. And even if we're not experiencing any of that right now, at this moment, just think back on things that happened today. Having to experience something that's uncomfortable, that's not welcome, having to be some around someone who's experiencing a mood, what that feels like. Sometimes you just want to walk right out the door. When we experience moods, we want to get rid of them, change the mood, association with the disliked, Separation from the liked. We have all kinds of experiences on a daily basis that are pleasurable, enjoyable, and that end, that change. And those little experiences of grief when something pleasant ends. When we have a nice conversation with someone and it's time to end it because we've got somewhere to be, something to do. Not getting what one wants. Just walk down the food table and you know what that is about. So we realize that recalling, remembering, recollecting the Buddha's teaching, his description, his words, talking about suffering, about desire, what they are, how he describes them, It always clarifies the picture, and that's one way of using this ability to review our aspiration. Review where we're at. Are we free yet? Is the mind developed? Is it still? Does it know suffering when it arises, and is it free from suffering when suffering arises? Or does it get entangled? Is it willing, is there a willingness there in the heart to experience suffering when it arises, to welcome it?
when we wake up in the morning, one of those days when there's a mood, what is the initial reaction? What is the response? So learning to look at that and appreciate what the situation is, appreciate what arises in the present moment, here and now, in terms of physical sensations, the experience of the body. When we sit here for a long time and it starts getting tight and achy, what are the reactions that arise? What are the responses? How does desire manifest? Is our aspiration to find freedom from suffering equal to wanting to experience bliss all the time and be happy forever after, never have to have a moment of suffering ever again? Is that our aspiration? Is it realistic? Is it according to the nature of experience? Is it according to the nature of sankharas? That anything unpleasant can cease forever after and we never need to be unhappy ever again? Is that what the Buddha is talking about? Or is what he's talking about understanding suffering? In which case we need to develop a willingness to experience it. We need to learn to recognize the resistance to experiencing suffering, not wanting suffering. Not wanting to be separated from the light not wanting to be associated with the disliked. Not getting what one wants is suffering. Can we open up to that? Can we let suffering inform the practice. So this position from which we learn to open up to suffering, to receive it, where we can recognize suffering as it arises, as an experience, we can recognize a desire not to suffer, not to have to experience this. We can recognize the desire to be happy, to be free from it. That place, let's say, which Lumpur calls the witnessing, consciousness, awareness, it's got to be separate from suffering in order to be able to recognize it. And it's not an ego trip a program, a personal program of developing a sense of self that can overcome suffering, a sense of self that doesn't suffer, that knows suffering. It's not something we create, it's something we learn to recognize. I mean, has been talking about learning to trust awareness 
for decades. All these decades of teaching, he keeps coming back to that trust awareness. How do we do that? How do we recognize awareness? What is it? From the Buddha, to all the teachers who've realized this truth, all the way down to the teachers we have today, the blessings of having Lompo remind us of that. They're all pointing to something that's actually there, that's not created. It's not something we have to construct or fabricate. It's something that's already there. How do we recognize it? How do we practice so that we can recognize this in our experience? Is something that's independent of happiness and suffering, independent of wanting and not wanting, and yet knows happiness and pain, knows tanha, kama tanha, bhava tanha, vibhava tanha. That knows the body, but isn't the body. That's a Zen koan. What is it? And it's not something we can put words on. We can use words to point to it, but it's something that we have to really learn to recognize, to realize, to know. It's really something that's only recognizable here and now when we stop with this aspiration to recognize reality, recognize the nature of phenomena of experience, recognize the nature of consciousness. recognize the nature of desire. We need to be able to experience desire without following it. Desire is something impermanent. Desire is movement in the landscape. So the only thing that can recognize movement is something that's still, that's not moving. The only thing that can re recognize change is something that does not change. The only thing that can recognize impermanence is that which is not impermanent. And the tricky bit is we're so addicted to sankharas, we're so addicted to be able to grab hold of things, all the things in the universe, physical things, mental things, emotional things. We're so used to things that we don't pay attention to that which knows these things, the space in which they arise, manifest, and is change and dissolve. And that awareness is not a thing, so we can't grasp it. We're used to language, we're used to concepts, to thoughts, that you write, can write down in black ink on a white piece of paper. It's clear, it's easy, I can see it and recognize it. But you can't do that with this ability to know the present moment.
when we're thinking, these thoughts arise and cease. And yet, what is it that knows the thoughts? So when we use these four idipanas, these four roads to success, learning to recognize what our aspiration is and how to bring it from where it is to be more in line with the Buddha's encouragement to be free from all suffering. Learning to recognize what we have in front of us right now. When we don't get what we want, to learn to recognize that. Being an alms mendicant is a really wonderful situation in which to be. We receive a lot of very nice food here at Amaravati. And yet the nature of desire is such that we're still always, there's this desire that would like this or that. And the eyes are roaming up and down the food tables and, oh, that's nice, this is nice, but where is, oh, I wish there was. And we have these ideas of what we would like and we don't get it. not getting what one wants. It's a very wide-ranging description of what we experience many times a day. So learning to recognize what we do have in front of us. Learning to recognize how living in a community is like this. We always have ideas of how things should be. Yesterday, Lompo was telling me that he's an expert in knowing what people should do. I think we're all experts in that. So notice how that operates, how that surfaces. Their habits, their mental habits, their emotional habits, habitual views, habitual attitudes. They're just, they're all just conditioning. And they're, the cocktail, the ingredients in the conditioning cocktail might be different for every one of us, but we all experience that. We all feel things differently and we don't choose how things make us feel, that's conditioned as well. But notice how living in a community, these feelings are always triggered. Our views are always running into other people's views. Our desires are not the same as other people's desires. What we think is right is not the same as what other people think is right. I 
Amaravati is a very interesting community in how it functions. I've lived for 18 years in Thailand, and in Thailand you very often have this model of the abbot, who's the all-knowing father and takes all the decisions, or most of them, and the monks in the community who decide to live with the abbot, they learn how to go kap ajan, and just go along with what the abbot says. Here at Amaravati, we have committees. There's the ASC committee, there's the EST, there's the ABC, there's 6S, 7B, there's Bhikkhu Samanera meetings, and Terra's meetings, and nuns meetings, and more senior meetings, more junior meetings, morning meetings, evening meetings. You'd think it's enough to drive anyone nuts, all these meetings. And yet at the same time, it's just another way of functioning as a community. When you live in Thailand and you have the one senior monk who's making all the decisions, you find yourself in the position of agreeing and disagreeing with the decisions this one individual makes just as often as you find yourself agreeing or disagreeing with the decisions that are made in a community like ours here. So at the end of the day, whether there is one benevolent dictator who makes all the choices or they're made more community, we're always going to run into these not getting what one wants, having to live with situations that we think should be otherwise. Is this right or is this wrong? Is this better or is that better? And one very good measure of how we're learning to deal with these conditions, how, where we're at in terms of awakening to the fact that these are conditions, they're not reality. They're just conditions changing. A good measure of where we're at in that development of understanding is how, how much we suffer from it. Suffering, this first noble truth, if we are able to develop the willingness to recognize it, the willingness to let it arise according to the causes and conditions that give rise to it, if we develop the willingness to experience it, knowing that it's impermanent, It gives us the opportunity to learn to recognize the causes of suffering. When desire arises and when we go and grasp desire, attach to it, follow it, indulge it, whether it's sensual desire, wanting, every, wanting everything to be comfortable and cozy and safe and secure and beautiful, We meditate, we don't want any noise, any disturbance. If someone's making noise, we ask them to please be quiet. We create business when we get involved with suffering, when we follow desire. Bhava tanha, wanting to become a good meditator. wanting to get good samadhi, to be able to come here and sit down and experience jhanas. How desirable is that? It sounds nice, 
but the moment we relate to it through desire, second noble truth, it leads us to one place, and that's the first noble truth, it's suffering. Learning to recognize that. There's nothing wrong with desire. There's nothing wrong with the objects of desire. It's the grasping of desire that leads to suffering. So learning to recognize that. And then playing around with it, and learn, when we learn to recognize desire, are we willing to let desire arise? Are we willing to experience desire? And just let desire arise, be what it is, and cease without following it. Desire to experience happiness or desire to get rid of discomfort, whether physical or emotional or mental. Can we do that? Wanting to get something and when we get it, wanting to be able to hold on to it so it doesn't change. Wanting to be right. And so we end up, every time we do grasp desire, get involved with desire, to become, to get, to get rid of, to experience, to avoid, every time we get involved with that, we end up with suffering. So suffering becomes a very convenient little red flag if, you're, if we're willing to uh, allow it to be part of our practice, to be part of this Noble Eightfold Path, embracing, developing right view, embracing the Four Noble Truths, and really opening up to the experience of suffering, allowing it to teach us. So that when something happens and we don't like it or don't disagree with it, can we just be with that? Can we just sit and experience disagreeing with something, disagreeing with somebody, and just let that be, watch it, don't follow it, don't try to get rid of it. It's uncomfortable. So not trying to run away of it or trying to change it, but don't follow it. Disagreeing with someone is like this. It's conditioned. Can I just stay with it and watch it? It just arose. It will cease. I don't know when it will cease. Can I just let it run its course and just wait it out? Watch it cease. And what happens then when it ceases, really be open to that. But the openness that's going to allow us to experience the peace and the freedom once an experience has ceased, when suffering ceases, that openness is something that we have to be willing to bring to suffering as well. We cannot be close to suffering and then be open to freedom from suffering. We need to be willing to experience samsara, experience impermanence, experience unsatisfactoriness, discomfort, sense desire, ill will, restlessness, drowsiness, doubt, these hindrances, not just get rid of them, but understand them. Let them arise and cease without getting involved with them, without following them, indulging in them, identifying with them, but knowing them rather than ignoring them.
and in this transformation from ignorance to understanding, what happens is letting go. One can always recognize both in oneself and in others around us when practice is actually at work and delivering results because letting go happens. Letting go of suffering is the natural result of understanding suffering. Letting go is not something we can do out of an act of will in relationship to suffering is something that happens naturally as the result of, as the consequence of understanding, really experiencing suffering, understanding its nature leads to letting go, letting go of this point of view from which we operate, me, mine, I, this personality. And when that is released, the point of view that emerges out of letting go of self is naturally seeing things in terms of Dhamma. It's an openness, a lightness, a stillness, a brightness. All of these things just arise naturally when we let go of desire, of self, of conditions, of views, of thinking. And it's not getting rid of them, it's just recognizing them for what they are and being willing to let go, let them be what they are. And the natural result of that letting go is peace. So I hope these reflections are useful. I'll stop here.